to Indianomics, India completes 77 years of independence. And at this emotional juncture, I thought it fit to invite one of India's longest serving policymakers, Dr. C. Rangarajan. Dr. Rangarajan was Reserve Bank Governor from 1992 to 1997, during which time he converted the dollar rupee from an administered rate to a market driven exchange rate. Bank lending and deposit rates, which were set by the Reserve Bank, were liberalized. And the government's unlimited power to borrow was also ended. In short, a lot of revolutionary steps. Dr. Angarajan, of course, continued his innings of policy making as the chairman of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council from 2004 to 2014. In between, he was also chairman of the 12th Finance Commission. And of course, he headed numerous other important committees and commissions, notably like the Statistics Commission. I don't think we can get a wiser voice to glance at the past 77 years and guide us about the future than Padma Vibhushan, Dr. Rangarajan. Sir, thank you very much indeed for joining us on a very auspicious day. Okay, thank you. Well, uh, first up, sir, you've uh, seen a better part of this uh, 77 years and 37 of those as actually policy maker. Uh, what would you say is the biggest achievement of the Indian economy? Well, India is now... Um, described as the fifth largest economy in the world. Um, of course, we are a big country. Uh, we have a huge population. Uh, that itself gives us a large economy. Nevertheless, I think that uh, as compared to what it was in two decades ago, uh, coming up to the level of the fifth largest economy is an achievement by itself, though there are other important uh, problems. Mm. Uh, oh, yes. Secondly, I would say that the we have achieved self-sufficiency in food grain. Um, that is a very important uh, development when you look at what we were and and how difficult the food situation was in India in the 50s and 60s. Thirdly, I would say that in the case of uh, the service industry, particularly the computer-related service industries. Yeah. We have done uh, very well, and we are counted as one of the largest exporters of, of uh, the these services um, by uh, the others. Mm -hmm. Therefore, and I perhaps also should uh, mention that we do, do have a reasonably strong industrial uh, base capable of producing a variety of capital goods, intermediate goods, and consumer uh, goods. Mm. Mm. Also, I will mention as lastly that um, India's uh, fertility rate has come down to close to two, mm. and therefore in another two decades, perhaps, the population will stabilize. Mm. Though we should have taken earlier, much earlier action, nevertheless, it is a fact that we are now at a level or at a stage where we can say that in two decades from now, mm. the population will stabilize. Mm. Fair point, sir. Uh, well, if you have to, uh, I, I do want to ask you more about our uh, goal uh, to become a developed economy or at least a high income economy, Viksit Bharat, by uh, 2047. But before that, a little more reminiscing, what would you say was our biggest policy mistake? Uh, that uh, didn't allow us to become like, say, the Asian Tigers? Well, the, in the 50s and 60s, and even up to 70s and even 80s, uh, India's strategy of development uh, contained, uh, let me say, four elements. Uh, one was uh, raising the savings and investment rate. Uh, the second was a dominant role for the state, uh, what we used to call uh, acquiring the commanding heights yes. of the, the economy. And uh, the third was the policy of import substitution, that we should produce in India what we were importing. And fourthly, an emphasis, industrialization with the emphasis on heavy industry. I would say in the 50s particularly, we had no clear um, uh, uh, situation uh, which explained how uh, a developing or a developed, underdeveloped country in those days, the term used, mm. could become a strongly developing economy. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, therefore, we can't blame the policymakers of, of the 50s. Mm. But it came to me, uh, came clear that as we move further, and as you are approaching towards the end of 70s or something, the strategy that we had adopted needed change. Mm. But I think the policymakers didn't make the change at that time. Okay. It took us almost another two decades before the changes could be made. Okay. Okay. Therefore, this broad strategy of development that we adopted in the 50s, though perhaps appropriate at that particular time, lost its way. Mm. And I think that resulted in our rate of growth mm. um, of, the, of the economy um, being around 3.7% okay. till the end of 1970s. Yeah. I think we needed a change at that time, mm. and we did make the change. Okay, so the 70s and 80s perhaps were the lost decades till we found ourselves uh, in, uh, you know, 1991. Uh, well, coming to 1991 itself, uh, uh, what do you think was the toughest and the biggest achievement at that time? Well, the point is that uh, uh, there were two things. One was to manage the crisis, mm. because we had to get out of the crisis. Yes. That is 1990 and then 1991. Yes. Steps had to be taken, first of all, to stabilize. And then we felt that after stabilizing, we need to reform the economy. Mm. Because it is not a question of just simply just solving the problem, mm. the balance of payments problem of 90 or 91. We have to build an economy which will not face such crises uh, from time to time. And therefore, we moved on mm. uh, to introduce uh, reforms. And that started almost in the in 1991, and it picked up speed mm. in the next years, mm. and then it was followed up by various uh, governments. Yeah. Yeah. I would say the, the, the decision uh, to devalue in, in, a, in a deep way in two yes. states, and even to ship gold yes. in a 1991 period in order to overcome some of the problems mm. are difficult decisions and um, they had to be taken. But the most important thing is we did not stop with solving the problems but moved on to make reforms. And if I would say in a short sentence that we made a break with the past in three important mm. ways. One, we dismantled the complex system of permits and licenses and controls yes. that dominated the system. Second, we redefined the role of the state. And thirdly, we gave up the policy of import substitution yeah. at any cost and decided to embrace uh, the international trade. Mm -hmm. So I will come back to the policies that you have mentioned because we seem to be going back to some of those policies, especially import substitution, under a diluted version called Atmanirbhar. But more on that later. Let me come to the way in which we handle public sector banks uh, uh, because that's, uh, that came directly under the Reserve Bank. You know, you, under you and, of course, Dr. Manmohan Singh and the others, you all got first state bank listed and eventually through the decade other public sector banks got listed. But since then we have not made any major change in the governance of public sector banks. What would you advise? Some time ago, your deputy at that time, uh, Dr. Reddy, had said that they should be brought under the Companies Act. What would your advice be to the current regime? No, I think the, uh, the most important point is that uh, several steps were taken to um, introduce um, and to initiate a competitive system in the banking system. In the final analysis, it is competition that will finally lead to efficiency in the system. And um, that uh, attempt was um, um, uh, taken care of by allowing a new um, private sector banks into the banking industry. Yes. It's in my time. And uh, as a result of it, I think we do have a situation in which almost 30 percent of the banking system is now in the private sector. Mm. So we really need to ensure that this competitive system does it. Uh, uh, does remain, mm. and um, and uh, we uh, we really have to uh, ensure mm. uh, that uh, the uh, the public sector banks, um, in order to survive and grow, uh, need to be very uh, competitive. Mm. 
But you were asking about the governance and so on. Mm. I think the most important thing is that the um, uh, the the board of directors mm. and how they are nominated and how they are selected is a key thing. Mm. In the final analysis, the management of a bank rests with the 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 board of directors. Yes. And therefore, the most the key thing that I would really recommend is ensure a proper system of selection of people to the board of directors and make the board of directors as a whole responsible for the functioning of the banking system. And um, th that, I think, is a critical um, variable mm. in uh, making the banking system uh, more efficient. Mm. Oh, your point is taken, sir. I think that's what Dr. Reddy also argued in 2000 and later on the PJNI committee in 2013, that bringing under the Companies Act, uh, you know, the board gets more powerful, they get independent directors, and uh, uh, maybe that will introduce the governance element. Also, the government can't use PSU banks for their schemes, like Mudra, etc., which ties them down and leaves uh, private sector banks a little freer. Uh, so I will, time permitting, ask you more about the banking system, but uh, you also wrote in the Hindu about how we should chase our new goal of a Viksit Bharat, a developed India, by 2047. What would you say should be the first two or three major policy changes we need to do? First of all, I think in order to be a developed country, our per capita income has to move from the current level of something like $2,500 to $13,000. Mm. And uh, this requires, according to the calculations uh, made by several, um, on, on, on some assumptions regarding the price level, uh, inflation, and uh, the, uh, the exchange rate, mm. uh, we, re we, need to re we need to grow at between 6 and 7%, but perhaps closer to 7%. Mm. This requires that the gross fixed capital automation rate or the investment rate, let us say, has to be about 35% if we assume an incremental capital output ratio of five years to one. Yeah. I think the, the incremental capital output ratio in recent period has been around five. Okay. Therefore, the first thing that we really need to do is that we ensure that the investment rate in the country remains at 35% uh, mm -hmm. of GDP. And um, that is critical if you really want to become a developed country. Okay. We are close to it. I yes. think we are now about 33.3% yes. of the GDP. And therefore, it is not something that is um, um, uh, it's beyond us. Mm -hmm. but, my, 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 but, but there is one point there. The recent increase in um, investment rate mm -hmm. has been because of the uh, increase in capital expenditures by the um, government. government of India. Uh, the, that is not the answer. Mm. I think the real answer lies in the private investment picking up because the increase in capital expenditure or by the central government has also been followed by high, high fiscal deficit. And yes. you look at the fiscal deficit of the government of India in the last four years, they are way above the 3% of the GDP, which was considered to be the appropriate. Therefore, we have to create the appropriate investment, the climate mm. for private investment to pick up. So that is one of the in, in important things that we have to uh, to do. Yeah. The, the the second thing is on the strategy of development. Mm -hmm. I think the government must have some idea, mm. and I would say that the strategy of development must be multi-dimensional. Mm. The East Asian Tigers. Mm adopted a single goal, yeah. like export-led uh, export growth. Yes. Now, that export-led growth is not possible now. Mm. Uh, first of all, uh, the developed countries are not growing that fast. Mm. Second of all, there is a change in the attitude of the um, uh, developed countries yes. in terms of free trade. Therefore, while exports are important, mm. the external demand is important. And in some sense, exports are a critical test of efficiency yes. of the economy. Therefore, we cannot ignore exports. But it is not the export-led strategy that will really lead us to a, a higher level. Mm. And, and I would really say that we really need to 
uh, have a multi-dimensional approach okay. to strategy of development. Okay. And the, the third point that I would mention is that um, the, mo the most or the biggest challenge mm. that is go, go, that India will have to face is about jobs. Yes. And employment. Yes. Um, the the fact is that the employment growth is not as fast as the income uh, growth. growth. It is true, jobless growth is bad, mm. but jobs without growth is not sustainable. Yes. The, let us not say that let us go, let us fill the vacancies in the government of India or the state governments. That's not the way to go about. I think the real problem is going to be that the new technologies that are looming in the horizon yes. are going to make the problem even more difficult. How to solve the problem? The solving the problem, simple problem is, you can say, why are you growing at 7%? Why don't you grow at 8%? Yeah. Now, that is not going to be very easy also yes. because of so many other considerations, including um, uh, uh, environmental control, the need to control emissions, yes. and so on and so forth. The thing is that even in spite of the induction of high technology, there are sectors of the economy which are relatively more labor intensive. I would suggest like food processing industry. Yes. I think what is really required is a combination of sectors of the economy, mm. which will be partly highly um, uh, labor intensive, labor in, and not capital intensive, uh, not I would uh, mm. that high technology intensive, yes. and sectors of economy which are relatively more labor intensive. Okay. I think that is the only way in which we can really solve the, the problem. Yes. The, 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 therefore, these are the three things I would yeah. mention, okay. which are critically important if you want to get to be a developed country by 2047. That, that's a very succinct uh, blueprint for how we should proceed. Dr. Agarajan, I have to take a quick break. I'm back with just a couple of more questions.